Hi and welcome to this third lecture on computer forensics by me, Joachim Shevrestad from the University of Skövde. Uh, in this lecture we're going to discuss some uh, computer theory that is of interest to forensic examiners. And while this lecture series, or I uh, assume that someone that is trying to follow this lecture series in full does have quite a bit of knowledge on how computers work. I think I still think that it's important to highlight some parts of computer theory that is of uh, great interest for forensic experts, but that may be overlooked by other discipline. Uh, the contents of this lecture is uh, a short discussion on secondary storage media and the NTFS file system, file structures, Windows registry, encryption and hashing, decryption and password cracking, uh, and there will be a short end of memory and paging. Uh, so if we go right at it with starting to discuss uh, secondary storage uh, media, uh, I first want to discuss uh, disk geometry, uh, basically how a disk uh, or a hard drive is structured. And uh, to begin, a hard drive is uh, usually structured into sectors, tracks and clusters, where a sector is the smallest allocation unit. And being the smallest allocation unit means that a sector is the smallest section of the hard drive that you can allocate to a file or a partition or whatever. Um, uh, the common size of a sector is, uh, or has at least traditionally been, 512 bytes. But in uh, modern hard drives, it's becoming more and more popular to have sector sizes of 4096 bytes. And the common, uh, since uh, one sector then is commonly 512 bytes, two, com uh, two sectors make up one kilobyte. And uh, thus, the size in kilobytes can be expressed with equation sectors uh, times the sector size in bytes um, divided by uh, 1024 is uh, the kilobytes divided by 1024 again to get the megabytes and by 1024 again to get the gigabytes and so on. Uh, you should, however, note, uh, notice the differences in units here. Uh, while uh, this way of counting will give you the size in what's called kibibytes or mibibytes, um, commonly kilobytes. The disk size when expressed or written on the actual byte is written in the gigabytes that's expressed GB. And one such gigabyte is only 1000 megabytes large. And this is why uh, oftentimes when you see uh, that it's written on a hard drive that it's 500 gigabytes large, it will only be uh, roughly 465 gig gigabytes when you see it from within the operating system. And that's because within the operating system in Windows, uh, the size is expressed in gigabytes uh, denoted GIB. Uh, so, okay, that's short on the disk geometry. Let's move on to how the d disk is uh, structured more logically. Uh, the first sector on the hard drive always houses the master boot record. And the master boot record, well, primarily, at least for us forensic experts, holds a disk signature and a partition table. And the partition table lists all the primary partitions on the disk. Uh, using master boot record, you can have four primary partitions on a disk. Uh, there is also another partitioning scheme called GUID partition table, GPT, that works in a similar way, but that allows for more partitions. Uh, what you should know about the partition table is that it contains partition table entries that dictates the starting sector and the sector count for each partition. Uh, and it also can, it can also tell us the partition type. Um, so that's it for master boot record and disk geometry going in more to, to partitions. And partitions are commonly formatted, formatted using a file system that is used to store data in a structured way. So you have your entire hard drive and then to be able to store data in a structured way you have to partition it using a file system. And um, Modern Windows computers use the new, new technology file system NTFS and what you should know about the NTF, NTFS structure is that it begins with a 16 sector long partition boot sector. sector. And the partition boot sector contains a master file table, and that is of great interest for a forensic examiner. Uh, the master file table, uh, MFT, houses information about all files and folders on the partition. 
um, in so-called MFT records and an MFT records is uh, 1024 bytes large. Uh, so digging a little bit more into what an MFT record is, it's actually a record that contains file metadata. About 400 bytes of the MFT records is metadata such as timestamps and the file name. And the record also has a data section of about 600 bytes that will contain the entire file if it's small enough. If it's a folder it will always or at least almost always be contained within the MFT records because they're so small. Uh, but oftentimes the files uh, can be contained within the MFT. And if the file is too big to fit in the MFT record, then the record will instead hold pointers to where on the disk that the file is located. And this is uh, a great time to tell you that when the file is contained within the MFT, it's called a resident file, and when it's not, it's called a non-resident file. That's just some forensic terminology. Uh, dwelling on. Uh, it's important for a forensic examiner to understand what happens when a file is deleted from an NTFS partition. This is true for mo most file systems. But first understand that the MFT decides what sectors that are allocated on the hard drive. Uh, the MFT contains the records telling you where all files is and where all files are allocated on the hard drive and that is what decides uh, if the sector is allocated or not. So if the sector is not allocated in the master file table, then it's okay for the computer to write data to that sector. And this is interesting because for performance reasons, uh, I would guess, uh, when deleting a file, the only thing that happens is that the MFT record is deleted. So when you're right-clicking a file and selecting delete, the file is not deleted at all. Uh, it's just the MFT record that is deleted and the actual file remains on disk until it's overwritten and this allows us to use forensic techniques to recover data with relative ease. Okay, so that's it for uh, second, uh, secondary storage media. Let's move on to uh, looking at file structure and uh, what I want to tell you here is that is basically how a file is commonly structured what's included in a file and the file is usually built with uh, with a structure of beginning with a header which is a section containing some m metadata which could be well it basically depends on the file type but it can be timestamps if it's a picture it can be gps coordinates if it's a word document it could be author information um, and the header will also commonly contain a file signature which is basically some data that identifies what type of file it is. After the file header, we have the file data, which is the actual data that's in the file. And sometimes the file will end with a trailer, which is quite similar to a file signature or the header, but instead of telling you the start of file, it will tell you the end of file. Uh, the way that you usually recover deleted files is by searching for headers and trailers. And if you look at the data, uh, that's in the middle of the slide here. You can see at the right section that it begins, begins with percent PDF-1.4. That is the file signature that is commonly used to denote a PDF file. So if I search a hard drive for that file signature, I may get a lot of hits in unallocated space and that those hits will indicate that I've found the beginning of a PDF file. And looking at the rest of the data it might be possible for me to recover that file. Uh, the final part that I want to bring up on the topic of file structures is something called compound files. And compound files are interesting because they're not uh, stored as is on the hard drive, if you will. Instead, compound files maintain their own file structure within themselves. And that's interesting because I mean, if you search the hard drive looking for data in text files, you just be able to search for strings. And if there is a text file with the string you're searching for, you will get a hit. But let's say that what you're searching for is within a compound file. Well, the thing is that the files that are located within the compound file will be compressed or other ways obfuscated. So you'll, so you'll have to unpack or um, well, what should I say? You have to uh, do some prior work to the compound file in order to fully examine it. Uh, zip files and RAR files and other archives, those are examples of compound files. And as you know, if you have a zip file on your desktop, you can't just look into what data that's in it. You have to right-click it and unpack it first. And the same applies, of course, for 
forensic examinations. There is also other file types that are compound files, such as most uh, Word documents are compound files. And that basically means that you can unpack them and uncover even more data than if you just analyze them as is. So that's it for file structure. Now we're going to move on to the Windows registry. Uh, and the Windows registry is a hierarchical database that stores information about users, installed application, the Windows system itself. Basically all settings that you set in Windows are stored in the Windows registry. And the Windows registry is structured as a tree structure where with nodes uh, where each node in the tree is called a key and every key may have value or sub keys that in turn can have more sub keys or values. Uh, there are four main parts of the registry that's of interest for a forensic examiner. They're called hives and they're located in uh, Windows 32 sys Windows System 32 config under the root of your system, which is usually the C drive. And the hives are SAM system security and software. Uh, and in addition to that, there is one hive for each user that is called ntuser.dat. And the ntuser.dat for each user is located in each user's home folder. And I just want to show you a, a picture that depicts um, the Windows registry examined in Access Data Registry Viewer. And here you can see in uh, up here in the left pane, then you can see the tree structure that constitutes the the Windows registry, and uh, those are all the folders here are keys, and you can see the values here on the right side. Uh, for for instance, here we're looking at a key that's called Microsoft Windows NT current version, and it contains a value for install dates that's expressed right here, and it's expressed in Unix time, which is, if I'm not mistaken, seconds that's passed since 1st of January 1970, but the registry viewer interprets, is, interprets it for us here so that we can see when this particular system was installed, which was April 28, 2017. Uh, the Windows registry uh, being uh, the storage area for Windows settings is a wonderful piece of information for forensic examiners. Okay, dwelling deeper into computer theory, I want to mention something about encryption. And this is a very abstract, abstract slide which tells you how symmetric and asymmetric encryption works. Uh, first of all, encryption is where you use some kind of algorithm to obfuscate data. Basically, what you want to do is take some data that you want to keep safe uh, and apply an algorithm to it so to transform it into a ciphertext that is unreadable. And the basic algorithm for encryption is that you take the data, which is called plain text, uh, denoted by a P here, you add a key, uh, which is a password or something, you run it through, through an algorithm and you get the ciphertext. Uh, using symmetric encryption, the, the process is completely reversible. So if you have the cipher key, uh, ciphertext, I mean, and the key, then you can run it through the algorithm and reproduce the plain text. And the caveat here is that the encryption is, of course, only as strong as the key. Because if I encrypt a file with some encryption algorithm, let's say AES, and send it out to someone, and it get in, gets intercepted, anyone who has the key can decrypt the message. Uh, to in part overcome this, uh, uh, this caveat, you can use asymmetric encryption, which uses two keys uh, denoted by key one and key two, uh, where key one is called a private key and key two is, no, key one is called a public key and key two is called a private key. So in this case, if I want you to be able to send encrypted messages to me, I would create a key pair like this, key one and key two, private and public. I will send you my public key. The only use of that public key, key K1, is to encrypt messages. So you take the plain text you want to send me, you encrypt it with K1, uh, the public key, and you get a cipher text. Now, not even you can decrypt that. The only key that can decrypt that is K2, which is the private key that I keep for myself. So when you send me the message, I can take your ciphertext and my, my private key, K2, and I can produce the plain text. And as I said, encryption is used to hide data from people that is not supposed to be able to read it. And there's another crypto technique that is called hashing. Uh, 
And as opposed to encryption, hashing is a one-way function that produces a unique digest for a set of data. So you have some sort of plain text, you input it to the hashing algorithm, and no key, no, no nothing, you just in, input the plain text, and then you receive a digest that is unique for that particular plain text. Uh, for a hash algorithm to be considered secure, it must have the properties of being collision resistant, meaning that there is only one a possible digest or age for each and every plain text, and it should also be irreversible, meaning that it's impossible to derive the plain text if you have the digest. And this is actually very useful. For instance, you can use it for fingerprinting, uh, which is useful in in forensics. For uh, for example, you can use it to identify duplicate files. I mean, if two files share the same uh, uh, share the same digest, then the files should also be identical, and that is because of the collision uh, collision resistance uh, uh, property. It can also be used to store, and it is used to store passwords in in many modern systems. Because uh, if I if I'm designing a system where users have to log on, then if and if they're going to log on, I have to store the passwords in some way, but I don't want to store them in plain text. But if I store them in uh, a hashed version, I store a digest of each password. Then when, whenever a user log, tries to log on to the system, then I can produce a digest of the password that the user is inputting on at the time of logon, and I can compare it with the user's stored uh, password digest, and if the two digests match, then I know that the user is inputting uh, his real password, and I can actually know that without knowing the actual password, which is rather cool. So, uh, for forensics, it's quite common that you need to crack uh, encryption or crack hashing because you want to figure out a password or you, you want to uh, break some kind of encryption that some criminal used to hide data from you. And basically, you can decrypt hashing and encryption in two different ways, either by decryption attacks or by password guessing attacks. I know that there are other ways to divide those two, but this is how I do it. Uh, a decryption attack, then, is when you examine the implementation of a crypto system, the implementation of a hashing or encryption algorithm. Uh, or you examine the algorithm in itself in search for weaknesses that allows you to revert a cipher or digest into its plain text. Uh, this is only possible against weak algorithms or weak implementations, but I've actually seen examples where you can use a decryption attack because, well, for instance, I've seen a case where, uh, where a crypto system used to send uh, encrypted messages back and forth was suffering the weakness of the the actual key being sent along with the message so that that was rather easy to break using a decryption attack the key in this case was like a, what was it 30 character long string or something that was completely random so breaking it using any other mechanism would have been pretty much impossible but since the implementation was so bad it was possible to break it and uh, well password guessing then are all the attacks where you attempt to guess or figure out the password and that would at least include brute force attacks, dictionary attacks, and social hacking. Uh, we're going to discuss brute force and dictionary attacks in more detail, but social hacking is when you basically try to trick the person that has the password uh, to give it to you, or you use other uh, social knowledge, uh, if you will, to figure out the password, such as knowing the fact that most people write down their and the password so if you're assisting on a house search you, m you may want to look for notes and to see if you find any notes of passwords that's an example of social hacking uh, okay moving on with the password guessing attacks uh, you should know that when you attempt decryption uh, using the wrong password most algorithm will return a constant called bottom and this is comparable to a null value and this gives us the knowledge that if we try to decrypt an encrypted message and we get some, something back, then we know that we have the right plain text because there is no way of getting the wrong plain text. And so if you express, this, express it like an equation, an unsuccessful attempt where you use the ciphertext and the wrong key, then you would get nothing back. But if you use the ciphertext and the correct key, then you would get the plain text back. And figuring out the plain text of a hash digest is uh, maybe perhaps a little bit 
more difficult in, in a technical aspect because there is no other way than to hash different values and then compare the digest that we produce with the digest that we want to crack and when we find a match then we crack the hash. So we basically take a large data set like a large uh, list of words and we produce digests for all those words and then we uh, and then we compare our digests with the digest that we want to crack and if we find a digest for one of our words we know that that's the word that belongs to the hash that we want to crack. So uh, looking at how a brute force attack works, a brute force attack is an attack where you try all possible passwords until you find the right one. Uh, and the nice thing about this attack is that you'll always find a correct, correct password, it's just a matter of time. Uh, however, the caveat is that the needed time may be very large, uh, very, very large, in fact. Uh, so large that it's not always feasible. Uh, so what we want to do to calculate if a uh, brute force attack is feasible is to calculate the time we will need to uh, crack a password. And to do that, we need to know the key space, that's how many different possible passwords there is, and we also need to know how many passwords that we can try in a day. And the number of passwords that we can try in a day is dependent on, uh, well, how much computer power we have, of course, but also the uh, encryption algorithm that we have to break, uh, or the hashing algorithm, because different algorithms are... Um, performing differently in in terms of speed uh, a slower algorithm will limit how many tries we can make in a day because each try will take longer time and it's actually uh, considered a security feature for an algorithm to be a little bit slow uh, so to calculate the key space uh, we can take the number of possible characters in a password denoted by s to the power of the password length so if we have the full english alphabet in big uh, and upper and lower case then that's 52 if i'm not mistaken 52 uh, possible characters and if we have an eight character long password that's eight so the total key space would be uh, 52 to the power of eight and then we can use the algorithm key space uh, divided by attempts per day and divided by two because on average you will have to exhaust half the key space and that's the average cracking time in days. If you want to know how long it will take to exhaust the entire key space to be sure to crack the password, just don't divide by two. Uh, and for some examples, uh, this is uh, an example of uh, sample times uh, of cracking passwords that are that can contain upper and lower case letters from the English alphabet and numbers, so that's 62 different signs, uh, with the ability to try 10 billion passwords in 24 hours, which is reasonable if you have one or a couple of computers. So looking at passwords with two, uh, two four or five characters of length, the cracking time is, well, extremely fast, but just going to six characters, you can see that the resulting key space begins to get large and the cracking time is roughly three days and then you can see an enormous growth in how long time it takes to crack passwords because if we have a random password of of seven characters we're up to 176 uh, days in cracking time in our scenario which well may be something that you want to to attempt but going to uh, eight characters then we have to wait almost 11,000 days before we crack the password which is definitely a long time and uh, an approach that can be used instead of the brute force attack is uh, is a dictionary attack and a dictionary attack is that what is when you instead of trying all possible password you build a dictionary that holds the passwords that you want to test and remember that we have 10 billion tries or something in 24 hours so we can list pre uh, quite a lot of words in our dictionary uh, and the thing is here as long as the password is in the dictionary, the password will be cracked. If it's not, the password will not be cracked. So the success of the dictionary attacks comes down to how skilled you are at building dictionaries. And I've actually made a method for you, which begins with fetching information from dictionaries, native and English, and fetch, fetching biographical information, which is uh, information about the person whose password you want to crack, because it seems uh, that uh, people tend to use information that relates to themselves in passwords. 
the next thing that we want to take is uh, data collected from other devices that belongs to this person. Maybe we can recover stored passwords or cool words or an index which we will discuss later from, from the person. Include that in your dictionary. And finally, search the internet for databases of leaked password and include those in your dictionary because chances are that even if even if the person whose password you want to crack is using very complex password, he may use the same password at some site that was hacked. Okay, take all the, those data sets, combine into one big list of words, and then in the third step, you want to morph the words uh, in your list by combining them in different ways, so adding numbers and dates to them, apply lead speak, uh, and such. And the resultant set will be your, the dictionary for your attack. And uh, a common size when I, for me when I worked with the police and did some password cracking was a couple of billion words. So it will not take that long time to exhaust uh, the list. Of course, depending on uh, what type of algorithm you want to crack. Okay then, so to finish off this lecture, we're going, going to have a brief discussion on memory. And uh, the memory, the random, which is usually the RAM, the random access memory, is... Uh, a storage unit that holds information that a comp uh, computer needs to carry out its current tasks. And you should know that the memory is lost when the computer is turned off. So this means that the information is current. It has to have been placed in memory since the last time that there was a power cycle on the computer when it rebooted or, or was turned off. And what's very interesting about the memory is that, well, first, this feature of being... Uh, lost when the computer is turned off means that it's the information in memory is current It hasn't been placed there like five years ago at least not likely and Since you can use the registry and other sources to figure out when the computer was lost turned off You can also figure out how current the information in memory is uh, And what you can find here is uh, passwords that the user typed in and plain text version of encrypted data Because you know if you have encrypted the document, but want to read it then you have to decrypt it and since the decrypted version is presented on screen that also means that a decrypted version is uh, placed in memory. Uh, you can also find malware in its true form. It's very common for uh, uh, people that create malware to try to obfuscate the code of the malware but when it's executed it's placed in memory and to do its tasks it has to take on its true form and th therefore you can uh, use the memory for malware analysis in a very effective way. Uh, you can also find similar information in a file called pagefile.sys and that's used for paging by the system. And paging is basically when you use the computer and the computer needs to store things in memory so much that the memory fills up, then parts of the memory called pages are temporarily placed uh, in the page file. So the page file is a source where you can find the same type of information. And what's nice with the page file is that it's stored on the hard drive, so it's not lost when the, mem when the computer is turned off. Uh, so that was it for this uh, discussion on some computer theory that is useful for a forensic expert. Uh, thank you for your attention once again, and if you have any questions, post them in the comments field, and I will see you next.